Hey Hossamaniacs, welcome back to Hossman Comics, it's Hossman here himself. Today we're going to take a look at the early evolution of the Solar Samurai of the Skies, Japan's greatest superhero, Sunfire. Now right off the bat there are two main misconceptions that we're going to deal into here. The first is that Sunfire is and always has been a hero. And the second is that Sunfire is a member of the X-Men. I am here to tell you, well yeah he's a hero, he's Japan's greatest hero, I said at the beginning. And yes he's very affiliated with the X-Men, but we're uh, going to take a look at that. Let's jump right in to his first appearance. All the way back in January of 1970, Roy Thomas and Don Heck gave us X-Men number 64 and that is the debut of Sunfire. So yes, right off the bat, he is debuting in an X-Men book, but he's not there to join the X-Men, no. He is there to destroy a monument that Japan is putting out at the UN because Japan's like, hey America, let's be friends. So in January 1970, we're really actually only, what, 25 years removed from the bombing of Hiroshima? Interestingly enough, Sunfire does mention that his mother was in that bombing or in the radiation blast of it, probably what caused his mutation. But his father is actually a delegate from Japan, but his uncle is actually like a Japan patriot thinking, hey, America still needs to pay. And, you know, his nephew gets these powers, so he gets into his ear and he's like, hey, you got these powers, destroy this. We got to make America pay for what they've done. Young, impressionable Sunfire listens to his uncle, you know, and he wants to wreak havoc and bring back all honor to Japan. His father discovers that Shiro Yoshida, his son, is Sunfire, and he's like, what? And he doesn't want to stand for that, but Sunfire stands up to his father and goes to destroy everything anyway. And his father stands in the way of it, but his uncle actually shoots his father, and then Sunfire in turn blasts his uncle. And by the end, he's actually just devastated and doesn't really put up much of a fight against the X-Men, just kind of surrenders. There you have it, his first appearance, he is a bad guy, through and through. Though it was later said Roy Thomas was actually creating a bunch of international mutants in this time period with the hopes of bringing them all together on a new X-Men team, much like the giant size X-Men would eventually become five years down the road. But Sunfire would have things to do between then. In fact, he would next appear in August 1972 in Submariner number 52. And in this, he, well, he, he fights the Submariner. Sunfire didn't quite return home. He actually fell in with another bad guy called the Dragon Lord. And he was like his henchman, basically. And the Dragon Lord is also all about bringing honor back to Japan. And Namor, of course, is, you know, famous World War II hero fought against the Japanese. They get into a little bit of a fight, but then a bigger fight breaks out because Sunfire is actually out to sink a ship under orders of the Dragon Lord. And he goes to do just that. Namor tries to stop him. They fight a bit, but then Sunfire does end up sinking this ship. Like, take a look at this. People are falling into the ocean. It is like the Titanic here. Sunfire is a villain. Like, a lot of people were definitely hurt or more here. This fight would continue on into the next issue, 53, which is written by Mike Friedrich and Bill Everett. This one, Namor's taking Sunfire and he's like, hey, look at what you've done. Now, this ship actually also contained some sort of chemical in it that is going to kill off all the plant life around it and that will eventually destroy everything in the ocean, all the plankton, all the coral, all the life in the ocean, which is going to in turn symbiotically destroy life on the planet. And Sunfire's like, well, crap, I didn't mean to do that, I guess, when you put it that way. So they decide to actually work together. Namor lifts up the boat, Sunfire fixes the hole in the boat using his atomic welding blasts. Then Namor spins a big hole in the ocean, a big whirlpool, allowing Sunfire to burn off all the bad stuff and then and they think, okay, now I guess we gotta go fight the Dragon Lord. Sunfire actually blasts a hole under the bottom of the ocean to come up in the middle of his base. And then in the next issue, which has an octopus on the cover and is completely unrelated, we get the three-way dance between the Dragon Lord, the Submariner, and Sunfire. In which the Dragon Lord is pretty handily defeated and Sunfire's like, well, Namor, I guess now it's time for us to finish our fight. And this is really cool. Actually, like, I liked the idea of this because it harkens right back to the original Human Torch and Namor fighting in World War II, right? Just that classic fire versus water thing. But Namor uh, just outmaneuvers him, flies under a bridge and Sunfire smacks himself on the bridge. And that's the last we see of him until November 1973. Steve Englehart and Bob Brown brought him onto the Avengers. Not onto the team, the Avengers, just into the book. So this is part of a big Avengers Defenders crossover. And you see right there on the cover, you'll never guess the identity of our mystery supervillain. You can probably guess because you're watching this video and it's all about Sunfire and you recognize Sunfire's arm. But yeah, the crossover was one of those things where a couple of Avengers go up as a couple of Defenders and they're each after something. In this case, they're after the Eye. It's Namor and Captain America, both invaders from World War One, but they are in Japan. And if you're near Japan, that means Sunfire's gonna show up, particularly at this point. They're fighting over the eye, and Sunfire swoops in and grabs it, and he's like, hey, I got this. Screw you guys. Cat America and Namor begin to fight, and they're like, oh, maybe we should actually, you know, team up. So like, okay, Namor punches Sunfire, and Sunfire drops it. Cat America catches it. That's really the end of that. But still, right there, says Supervillain, right on the cover. It'd be a couple more years till June 1974, when Mike Friedrich returned to Sunfire, bringing with him artist George Tuska on the Invincible Iron Man, number 68, Night of the Rising Sun. This also features the debut of Iron Man with a nose. But Iron Man is over in Vietnam for various reasons, and Sunfire is in Vietnam because he's trying to regain honor in his homeland Japan. 
he's taken it upon himself the task of advancing Japan's interest in reconstruction of Vietnam. So he's kind of just representing Japan in his own ways, deciding what to do and where. And then he sees that Iron Man is there. He's like, Iron Man is representative of Tony Stark. And Tony Stark is like an industrialist that is trying to make way into Japan. So screw Iron Man. There's also a side story where the Mandarin is inside Unicorn's body and the Unicorn has died. It's somewhat related. But of course, you know, Iron Man and Sunfire have to fight. And, and like, I'm just going to say it. Sunfire tanks punches from Iron Man. Like, he just doesn't take them well, but he takes full punches from Iron Man and is not unconscious. But then, when they're fighting, the Mandarin senses this power source nearby, and that is Sunfire, so he teleports him away, and Iron Man's like, well, gotta go see what this is. And Sunfire is just stuck in this contraption, and the, the Mandarin needs Sunfire's energy to go back into his own body, and he tricks Sunfire into shooting all his energy into this thing, and he does, and Unicorn, I believe, dies. And issue 69, the next issue of Invincible Iron Man, Iron Man actually flies down to the bottom of the ocean, not to rescue Sunfire, but he goes to, like, beat up the Mandarin and see what's all up here. And he's sinking his underwater base, and Sunfire is still stuck in that machine, so Iron Man is like, okay, well, I'm not gonna let this guy die. He actually goes down and frees Sunfire, knocks him out in the process, but he pulls him to the surface and saves him. Then, in Invincible Iron Man, issue 70, like, the Mandarin is back in his base, he's unleashed Ultimo, and Sunfire and Iron Man have to end up teaming up to fight Ultimo and the Mandarin. Upon teaming up with Iron Man, he's like, okay, like, you saved my life twice, you know, you're a personal representative of Tony Stark, and that kind of sucks, but you seem like a good guy, Iron Man. Iron Man actually is Tony Stark, as we all know. Though he is labeled as a villain, he usually starts the villain, he does always end up teaming up with the good guys to help it. So, I mean, he's always been somewhat of the hero. He even says, like, hey, perhaps we can mutually coexist, Americans and Japanese. Like, yeah, the world knows that, man. And Iron Man's like, you want to help me with Yellow Claw? And he's like, no. <laughs> So as you can see, there was a little bit in there between his X-Men appearances, but Giant Size X-Men did come calling, and he answered the call. Len Wein and Dave Cockrum, obviously, in May 1975, brought in the Giant Size X-Men, Colossus, Sunfire, Storm, Wolverine, Banshee, Thunderbird. Did I miss one? Nightcrawler. I did. If you want to know more about these particular X-Men, check out my video on the next 10 X-Men. Anyway, that's a plug. In this issue, you can clearly see, right there, Xavier says, hey, I need you to help me get my X-Men back from Kakroa. And he says, I owe you nothing, Professor. Professor, but perhaps I owe something to myself. And he becomes Sunfire and he goes and helps. Though it should be said that he's like hesitant. He's back in New York and they're making the plans and he's like, I don't want to help. And Cyclops is like, come on, you owe it to your fellow mutants. And he's like, I don't even like my fellow mutants. I'm not risking my life to help them. And he doesn't, he does not go with the X-Men. But when the X-Men take off in their little jet, he does fly up to catch up. He's like, okay, okay. He's like, my reasons are my own and I'm just, I'm going to help you, okay? And him and Nightcrawler get teamed up. They fight Krakoa. They save the original X-Men. And then the very next issue in X-Men 94 by Chris Claremont and Dave Cockrum, Sunfire says, well, I'm out of here. <laughs> Xavier says, what? I thought you agreed to join us. And he says, I agreed to help you, Professor, once. And once was quite enough. My duty is to my country and my emperor. I care nothing for the world you offer. I want none of it. None of you and none of your X-Men. And he leaves. He says, I bid you farewell, Professor. You and your pack of idealistic fools. But hear me, Xavier. Should you need this samurai's help again, do not seek me out and do not ask, for Sunfire will refuse. And that's it. That's it. That's his appearance in that issue. So that gets me thinking. Why, why does everyone say Sunfire joined the X-Men here? He did not. He clearly helped them out and then just disappeared. He did not join them at all. He did not stick around. He helped them for one mission and he left. And that is kind of Sunfire's MO, honestly, moving forward with the X-Men. Though his next appearance wasn't even in the X-Men. It was back in Iron Man. Bill Mantlo and George Tuska took on this one in the Invincible Iron Man number 98 in May of 1977, which is when Star Wars came out. So Sunfire has returned to his villainous ways and he's actually attacking Stark International. There are some Japanese industrialists that are visiting Stark International to talk about a merger and making some deals. And Sunfire's like, now! I'm gonna burn this American piece of crap company to the ground. Japan can do it on its own. Tony Stark is there. He's working on some new armor. He ends up grabbing some guardsman armor to go fight Sunfire because he got to protect his own interests and be the hero. And then the guardsman who was tied to a table, long story, gets up and takes the new Iron Man armor as soon as it's ready and he goes and helps him out. And then Iron Man switches back into some other Iron Man armor and continues the fight in the next issue. Yeah, they kind of beat the crap out of each other until Sunfire is down and out and that was really it. As you can see here, as much as I kind of like the idea of Sunfire being a Submariner villain, he appears to be leaning more towards the Iron Man route. But that kind of comes to an end when we get to X-Men number 118 and the X-Men have to visit Japan and of course, like I said, when you visit Japan, you deal with Sunfire and Misty Knight for some reason. Well, I know why, because Chris Claremont was writing both the issues. <laughs> this was February 1979, just about a couple of years later. The X-Men are in Japan, I can't honestly remember why, but they're there. This is actually, I should point out, where Wolverine first meets Mariko as well and Mariko is Sunfire's cousin. The Silver Samurai is also Sunfire's cousin. Interestingly enough, Sunfire later, like 20 some years after this, would have a 
another sister be revealed, but she's not revealed here for whatever reason. Anyway, Moses Magnum and some mandroids show up and they put Sunfire down for the count and the X-Men continue this in the next issue where Sunfire has joined, well he hasn't joined them, I should use my words carefully, but he is teaming up with them to again burrow down underneath the ocean. It's a really great combination of powers. You see Cyclops optic blasting and Sunfire's kind of using his heat to reinforce the walls, but he is working alongside the X-Men and they fight Moses Magnum until Banshee unleashes all of his voice to destroy his base. And that continues again into the next issue with 120. Uh, Banshee actually lost his voice and was in the hospital for a little bit after this and the X-Men did stay in Sunfire's home. Like they were very welcome there. He even says to Cyclops like, hey, thank you, my friend. Thank you for all you've done for me and Japan. I'm proud to fight by your side and would be honored to do so again. Farewell. And even Cyclops like, yep, feelings mutual, Shiro. If you're ever in the States, you know, our home is your home. And this was written by Chris Claremont, the same guy that had Sunfire say like, hey, sh chop it up your ass. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing. But, I mean, though I said like he didn't join the X-Men at this point, he really was an ally of the X-Men. We do kind of see that evolution from villain to hero, though he was always kind of a villain. It's one of the interesting things about a villain, he's fighting for his own country, he's fighting for his own reasons, right? He wasn't just straight up wreaking havoc and robbing banks and killing people, despite definitely people dying on that boat. The Contest of Champions is where he would next appear. This was a really big thing. They call it the first Marvel crossover. I'm not sure that it actually was, but it was a pretty big event in June of 82. There were a few different writers, uh, Mark Grunwald, Steve Grant, Bill Mantlo, and a couple of different artists on this, John Romita Jr., Bob Layton, and essentially like every hero from across the world was grabbed. They were to take place in a big game between the Grandmaster and Lady Death. And interestingly enough, they were really focusing on some of the international heroes in this this one. Uh, a lot of them were created specifically for this. I want to say Shamrock and Defensor and Talisman uh, didn't exist before Contest of Champions. I could be wrong. Blitzkrieg. Sunfire did exist. He represented Japan. Sabra's there. And basically, like I said, just every hero from the Marvel Universe at the time is there. And then the Grandmaster and Lady Death choose their teams and then they have to fight 3v3 fighting over a piece of pie, basically. Gold Trivial Pursuit piece. Sunfire gets teamed up with the Invisible Woman from the Fantastic Four and Iron Fist. And they have to go up against Daredevil, Darkstar, and Talisman. And basically, Sunfire says, uh, screw you guys, I'm gonna work on my own. And he just takes off. And then Darkstar and him fight up in the sky. Their fight does crack open some of the ocean water where Daredevil sees the piece and ends up getting it. So, Sunfire's team lock. And that was three issues, and Sunfire really barely appeared in the third issue. Where he did appear next would be in The Incredible Hulk, number 279. This was written by Bill Mantlo, and Mark Grunewald was the artist on this one, actually. This one was in January 1983, and it was kind of almost a follow-up to Contest of Champions. Not quite, but it was, basically, there was a big Hulk acceptance parade, and it was another case of just, hey, look at all these heroes we can stuff onto one page. I think you see Sunfire in a big wide shot right there, but I can't be too sure. But then later he does straight up appear and say, this is a new beginning, warrior. Just representing Japan saying, hey, Hulk is great. But a lot of the international heroes did show up there again. And then we jump to Uncanny X-Men number 181, Chris Claremont and John Romita Jr. This is May 1984, so another year-long gap. And basically there is a big dragon. <laughs> That's, what can I say? The X-Men are going to fight a big dragon, and they are in Japan. So if you're in Japan, and there's a kaiju, your boy Sunfire's gonna show up. And he's kind of like, hey, X-Men, you didn't even call me for help. You just showed up to fight a dragon? Come on, guys. Storm gets knocked out of the sky. Sunfire tries to catch her. I mean, he's doing, he's, he's, he's helping the team. He's fighting alongside the X-Men, being really noble, sacrificing himself, because he does not take that landing well with Storm. But he is there fighting the X-Men. It should be noted also, at some point in here, there was a wedding. Wolverine and Mariko were gonna get married, but they ended up not getting married for various reasons involving the Silver Samurai. And Sunfire just wasn't there and I thought that was really odd. Like, they were all at Sunfire's house in Japan for the wedding, but no Sunfire. The last one we're going to talk about today in detail is actually Sunfire's 21st appearance in November 1989, so pretty big gap there actually. It's in Marvel Comics Presents, which was just an awesome format. They would just take like five or six stories and put them in one comic. Sometimes they carried on from one to the next, sometimes they didn't. There's one in here where Black Panther fights a guy in his hand, gets caught in an escalator, it's brutal. It's awesome. But the one involving Sunfire actually takes place in Japan. The Corrupter is like robbing banks in Japan. He's like, why didn't I come to Japan sooner? This is absolutely great. Japan doesn't have any superheroes, and Sunfire just burns the sidewalk in front of him. He's like, why do people keep saying that? Come on. And the police take care of him. But then Sunfire goes, and this is actually where they say he's a student. He also says he has unstable molecule costume that he can turn into regular clothes from his time with the X-Men. So, I mean, he must have been pretty tight with the X-Men to get cool technology like that. But he's a student, and this guy, Deadline, is like, hey, I'm going to destroy Japan. I'm going to destroy the whole world, actually, but I'm going to start with Japan because there's no heroes. And Sunfire's like, man, there are heroes. And he goes and fights this old man and actually gets his butt whooped a little bit. But he does end up saving the day and what i like about this like it's just a little throwaway story but it does show like the whole time 
that we aren't seeing him. He's in Japan, being the greatest hero of Japan. So he has reasons for not coming to America, not joining the X-Men, because he's in Japan. He's got stuff to do in Japan. He hasn't put together a superhero team for Japan yet, though he will. But really, that took us from 1970 up to almost the 90s. His next appearance is in the 90s in Deathlock. And then he pops up in the New Mutants. He pops up in Avengers West Coast. He pops up in something called Black Axe. He's in the X-Men for a little bit. Wolverine, he shows up in Namor again. The other thing I want to touch on, actually, not too many appearances from now. He shows up in a pretty prominent role in Alpha Flight's new series from 1997. And what does he do in this Alpha Flight series? Well, he puts together that team I talked about. He's like, Canada has a super team? Well, Japan needs a super team. And he puts together the Big Hero 6. And yes, I mean that Big Hero 6. Ba -la 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 -la. And they would continue to pop up in Alpha Flight and eventually get their own series the next year called Sunfire and the Big Hero 6. It was a limited series, three issues. I just think it's worth noting that, like, Big Hero 6 is actually a Marvel property. A lot of people realize that, but, like, it just seems like such an odd choice to make a Disney movie out of. And I love that movie, honestly. Sunfire and Silver Samurai not being there is what it is. It's a fun movie. But that's where I'm going to leave this video today. Actually, I'm going to leave this video after asking for a bit of help because I'm looking through everything. I'm reading as much Sunfire as I can here. And I have a question to put out to you guys. As you may know, I'm working on the videos where I talk about every member of the X-Men and when they joined. And I, I succinctly decided that Sunfire did not join the X-Men in the time of Giant Size X-Men. And I'm honestly trying to see if he ever joined the X-Men at all. I know he fought alongside them a lot. I know that he would join up with x -Corps. I know he would join up with the Uncanny Avengers. And I know he would become a Horseman of Death. And I know he got tangled up in the Twelve and just all kinds of things. And I'm sure he probably joined during the Krakoa Age. But if you can help me out in the comments and let me know if you know a time when he actually fought alongside the X-Men for two or three consecutive missions. Like, did he ever officially join the X-Men? Did he live in the mansion? I'm, I'm honestly having a hard time finding that. Anyway, if you guys could like this video, subscribe to this video, comment down below your favorite Sunfire time, and if you know for a fact if he joined the X-Men or not, that would be really great. Until the next video, please stay hossy, and I will catch you in the future. Okay, bye.